it's 11 past two, so good afternoon, everyone. I am Prudence, and it's my pleasure to serve as your host today. A warm and hearty welcome to our guests, the students of the University of Free State, and everybody else who's logged in online to join us today. Um, today, we have an exciting adventure planned as we journey to the Kruger National Park with our guide, Ms. Pepile Maboya. Uh, Pepila's passion for our natural world is truly inspiring. She firmly believes that environmental education is the key to igniting change and fostering a deep connection with our environment in people of all ages. Today, she will take us on a special tour of the Litaba Elephant Hall, sharing her world of knowledge and enthusiasm for the natural world. So let's embark on this journey with Ms. Pepila Maboya as our guide and mentor and let the wonders of the great tuskers unfold before our eyes. In the whole world, we have two types of elephants. We have an African elephant and an Asian elephant. These elephants are found in two different continents. When you look at the Asian elephant that's at the top, you can see they have small ears, small tusks, and one finger like tip on their trunk, which is quite different when you look at the African elephant, which is at the bottom. They have massive ears, big tusks, and two finger like tips on their trunk. Another factor that you can look into is their overall shape. When you look at the Asian elephant, its back is more concave, while African elephant has a dip on its back. When you compare whales to elephants, the whales are definitely much bigger, but on land, the elephants take the mark from us humans. Looking at the next stop, we'll be looking at the elephant's heart. So the elephant heart looks and functions much like a human's heart, this heart belongs to a sub-adult elephant and it weighs about 9 kilograms in weight. For an adult, it will be about 27 kilograms. So for us humans, our heart is equivalent, is equivalent to the size of our fist. So if you form a fist, that's how big your heart is. And comparing it to this preserved heart, it's quite small. This is a coronary artery. It's also what you will find in our human hearts as well as you guys can see when you look closely to this preserved heart. Unfortunately, elephants do face heart diseases and they lead to sudden mortalities as well. This is a cross section of an elephant's skull. It has been cut in half. An interesting fact is that elephant's brain are four times the size of a human brain. Our human brain is located at the top of our skull, but for the elephant brain is actually located at the back of their skull. Now the blue section that you see here, that's basically the nasal cavity. So where oxygen will go in and carbon dioxide will go out as well. We're unsure why elephants have air pockets in the skull. As you guys can see with the yellow mark there, there's still research ongoing at the moment. This is a real adult elephant skeleton. When you look at the skull, you will see the elephant tusks. In most mammals, the tusks are usually elongated canine teeth, but for elephants, the tusks are actually elongated in sizes. Elephants have unique feet in the animal kingdom, so look closely. Elephants don't walk on flat feet like me and you, but they actually walk on their tippy toes. On their front legs, they have five toes in each leg, but when you look at their back legs, they have four toes in each leg, so not the same as us. The hind legs are much thinner compared to the front legs. Now, this is because most of the elephant's weight is actually located on the front. So the front legs have a massive responsibility to support the greater weight of the elephant. So they have to balance themselves using their front legs. Elephants have a complete rib cage. The chest part is missing here because it's made out of a cartilage, the same material that you will find in our human ears and also in the elephant's ears. Elephants have massive ears that work as radiators as they flap them throughout the day to cool down their body temperature. The elephant's trunk has no bones, it's made completely out of muscles, and it will weigh about 100 to 140 kilograms. Coming to the gestation period, elephants will take 22 months to have a baby. For us humans, it's 9 months. As you guys can see on the wall, this is how the fetus or the baby elephant actually grows inside of the mother's stomach. When it's born, it's 120 kilograms. So it takes 22 months because it has to be fully developed when it's born. There's always going to be danger, so the feet must be able to stand up and be ready to run. The brain fully functioning to understand what mom is telling the baby to run to and where as well. Looking at the wall here, these are the heights as the elephant grow. 
We have a one-year-old, three-year-old, six-year-old, and an adult elephant. Now, we compare these heights to our human heights, as you guys can see on the wall this side. So just to give you guys a perspective, this is more or less how you would be tall or short when you're standing next to either one of those. When I'm standing next to a one-year-old elephant, I'm quite tall. When I move closely to the three-year-old elephant and I compare it to my own height, my own height, we literally the same height, so I'll be a three-year-old elephant. Moving to a six-year-old elephant, measuring my height again, I started becoming shorter. Moving to the last is an adult. I'm an adult, but I'm not even big as this guy. Elephants are big animals, guys, four meters tall. Looking again at the elephant's feet, this is what you normally see when you look at the elephant's footbed out there in the bush. But when you look closely, you can see elephants actually walk on their toes and a large portion of the foot is comprised of a fibrous cartilage. Now, this cartilage acts much like a shock absorber and has elastic properties which help the elephant maintain grip and move noiselessly through the bush. Looking at the tusks, tusks are composed of what we know as ivory. A third of the tusk is actually hidden from view and is embedded deep in the elephant's skull. Now, this part of the tusk contains a pulp cavity made out of tissue, blood, and nerves. Elephant tusks never stop growing, but due to breakage and wear, they almost never reach their full length. But males normally have much larger tusks compared to females. Looking at ecology, elephants are very adaptable to a variety of habitats and they utilize a wide selection of food sources. In summer, your newly sprouted green grass will be grazed upon by elephants. In dry winter, elephants will resort to browsing. Elephants are fond of fruits, your roots, your herbs, and they will take great lengths to access these food sources. Now, an elephant bull requires about 200 to 300 kilograms of water a day. So this means they release a huge amount of dung. So your dung beetles will collect all this dung, put it back into the soil where they'll also put the eggs, and they, in doing so, they return the nutrients back to the environment. How to edit an elephant? You will have to look at its teeth, especially its grinding teeth. So elephants will have six sets of teeth in their lifetime. For us humans, we have two sets. The teeth will wrap from the back of the jaw, moving forward in a track-like motion, replacing the worn-out molars. So on this table, I'm just going to show you how this happens. This is a nine-month elephant's jaw. We use different colors so that you guys can understand which set we're talking about. Set 1 is the yellow one, set 2 is the green one, set 3 is the blue one that's hiding at the back. Coming to the next one, this one it's a one-year-old elephant, still an infant. When you look at set 1, you can really see it's small, so it's wearing out. Set 2 is fully developed and 3 is hiding at the back. Coming to the next one, this is about three and a half, so four years old. When you look at the teeth, set two is worn out. When you look at set number three, it's fully developed, and four is still hiding at the back of the jaw. Coming to the next one, the jaws are getting bigger. This one is a seven-year-old elephant. When you look at the seven-year-old elephant's teeth, the set three is still in good condition. The elephant can still eat, but four is slowly coming through as well. This one is a 15-year-old elephant. Now, when you look at the teeth, set three is about to fall out. Set four is fully developed, and five is hiding right at the back. Coming to the next one, this one is a 25-year-old elephant, so that's an adult. When you look at the teeth again, when you look at set 4, starting to wear out, but 5 is fully developed and ready to be used, and 6 is still hiding in the back. Coming to the next one, it's a 29-year-old elephant. Now, when you look at the 29-year-old elephant's teeth, they're still in good condition, set number 5, and 6 is slowly coming through at the back. 
This one is a 40 year old elephant, quite old. When you look at this elephant's teeth, uh, this one's not set five is worn out, so six is fully developed at the back is closed. So this is the last set. Coming to the last jaw, it's a 56 year old elephant. Now, when you look closely, you can see the elephant's teeth are actually flat and they're cracked. So this elephant has a massive problem when it comes to eating, considering they need to eat a lot of water. They will survive a couple of months with water, but it won't be long. In most cases, elephants, if they're not pushed, they die because they're hungry. Now, depending on their diet, the worry process is quite different. Elephants would die at the age of 65 years old. Coming to the next stop, we'll be looking at gender differences. So bulls in general are much larger and heavier than cows. So when you see them together, the shape of the forehead can be examined and can generally give an indication of the gender. Now looking at this elephant head, the massive ears actually look the same as our African continent. So this is where we think the name derived from. So an elephant bull's forehead is usually more rounded, whilst an elephant cow's forehead tends to be more angular. You can see this more closely in this picture here. So if you're a female elephant, you will remain with the elephant herd for the rest of your life. But if you're a male, once you're 14 years old, at the onset of your puberty, you will leave the elephant herd. Now, as a teenager, a male elephant will learn a whole new life away from the nurturing and protection of the breeding herd. So bulls will achieve full maturity at the age of 29 years. At this age, he will go into must. Now, the temporal gland that you guys see in between the E and the I, with the females, whenever it's wet or has a wet mark there, it actually indicates that she's under stress. Your car's too close or she's not feeling comfortable because of the calves. If it's a bull, this is when he's in must. So this is a time when your bulls are becoming more sexually active. He will then seek out your breeding herds, look for any female that's in oestrus. He will consort the female and possibly mate with the specific female as well. So whenever you see this, just be more cautious if it's whether a bull or it's a cow. So coming to the social structure, um, elephants have tied family bonds within the breeding herds, which provide a stable environment for rearing of calves and for the protection from predators. Now, the female matriarch is normally the dominant cow in the family, and she's the one that leads the herd. So they are renowned for their intelligence. Elephants form close family bonds with a complex social behavior. Relationships will form between mothers, offspring, family members, different clans, even between independent adult bulls as well. Now, looking at agonistic behavior is divided into three categories. There is dominance, defense, and fighting. Elephants are usually peaceful animals, becoming aggressive only when they're sick, when they're injured, harassed, or when there's calves around, or when they're in must. An aggressive elephant is, has a very impressive sight. It would stand tall. The head and tail will be raised, the ears will be spread, it will trumpet and it will vigorously shake its head. Now, aggressive interactions between macho bulls are rare and usually low-key, but serious, even fatal fights will actually occur, as you guys can see on the picture right here. In the Kruger National Park, we had elephants that have big tusks. So in the 1920s, there was a group known as the Magnificent Seven. At the hall, you will find six of the Magnificent Seven tuskers on display. Mafuyan is one of the Magnificent Seven. When you look at the tusks, they're quite straight. They have the same length and the same weight. He has a 10 centimeter diameter hole on his skull, which stretches all the way to his nasal cavity. And he was actually able to breathe through this. Coming to the next tusker, we have Shaul. Now, I'm not sure about you, but for me, whenever I look at this tusker, it makes me think of the African mammoths, your hairy elephants that we had in ancient time, when you look at the shape of his tusks. Now, this bull, he stood at 340 centimeters at shoulder height, so he was a big bull, and he holds the record of the longest tusker ever recorded, not just in South Africa, but in Africa as a whole. The tusker over here is Shingwezi. Shingwezi shows us a good example of a classic master's 
and seven tusks. One is longer, one is shorter. Pelone had a very notable weight when you look at his ivory for an ivory-sized bull. Zombo has the classic shape of the Crow National Park's elephants. Unfortunately, he was, he was killed by poachers using an AK-47 rifle, but luckily the tusks were not taken. This is Langolene, and he was the most secretive of the tuskers. Dolomiti has a curved tusk, and he was considered to be the tallest elephant, standing at 340 to 345 centimeters. Gambaco was commonly seen by the rangers at open, but unfortunately, after crossing the Kokola River, he got shot. The tusker that you guys see over here, his name is Mandleve. He actually has a V-shaped tear on his left ear. He holds the record or the elite title of the heaviest tusks on record in the Kruger National Park, weighing an impressive combined weight of 142.5 kilograms. So his tusk surpasses Peluana's ivory weight record. Looking at elephant and men, elephants are hunted for their tusks, which are used to make ivory objects. So people will hunt elephants using a rifle where they will target exactly where the elephant brain is located, as you guys can see on the picture right here. Another thing they do is to make pitfalls, whereby a hole will be dug and it will be covered by grass while having spikes in it, the elephant falls in it and it will die. They will hang a spear on a tree branch, it will fall directly where the elephant brain is and the elephant will die. Now in the Kruger National Park, we have food rangers that conduct patrols throughout the day, throughout the night, you name it. So this is some of the stuff they actually found when they were doing patrol. As you guys can see, there's sneakers, there's sandals, there's boots, there's even a pot. Now this pot indicated to us that when poachers come to the Kruger National Park, they spend nights and nights looking for the specific animal. Now in the case, we also have an elephant shoulder blade. This elephant was shot six times. The six bullet actually went to the task as you guys can see over here the radio i'm guessing they were using it to communicate with people out there in the field now once the elephant has been chopped off like they've taken the task what poachers are doing now is to target your vouchers now remember whenever there's a dead animal in the kruger park or anywhere they will circle so this indicates there's a dead animal around so when the vultures come in and eat your jackals your lions you name it Every single one of those organisms will die from that poison that has been put in that carcass, unfortunately. So your rangers are currently working with your canine unit, as you guys can see on the picture here. So they are very good when it comes to tracking your poachers in the field. But the fight and the war rages on today. This is not only for the elephants, but for your rhinos as well. Good afternoon once again. Um, I would just like to thank Pepilia for her very informative talk on, on elephants and showing us around the, the elephant hall. So for everybody who's joined in and the students in the class, we can now take your questions. If you have a question, you can lift up your virtual hand. Um, you can write it in the chat and I'll read it out loud and can engage with Pepilia. She's on the call. Hello, um, I would just like to know how do we intend to conserve the elephant's migrate, uh, migratory corridor um, since there are borders over which they can't really cross? That's a very good question. <laughs> um, okay, so considering the shape of the Kruger National Park, it's very narrow on the side and elephants are known to migrate from the west to the east. So what we do in the Kruger National Park is basically to persuade the elephants to move from the north to the south by using water points. So they get to move like where water is no more or less found. So that's how we are doing basically their own way of migratory patterns here. But it is it is a massive challenge because you're kind of changing an animal that used to walk west to east and you're causing it to walk north to south. But so far... There's been less elephants going out of the fence. So in a way, it's working, but we have to look at a much better solution in the future, that's for sure. Okay, thank you. And then I just want to hear one more question. Earlier, you mentioned that, uh, it was mentioned that elephants, that the African elephant's backbone is concave and the Asian one is convex. Is there a reason why? Huh. You were taking me back to school. <laughs> uh, <laughs> okay, that's a tricky one. 
I'm not quite sure. I'll have to refer this to my senior, Kirsty, to answer this question, <laughs> if she's on the line. Kirsty, can you help? Sorry, can you just repeat the question? Uh, why is the African elephant's backbone concave while the Asian elephant's uh, backbone is convex? Uh, I, look, I'll be quite honest with you. It's not something that I've specifically heard before. If you look at the African elephant, as they get older, their back does become more convex as well. So I would imagine it's an evolutionary um, issue based on um, morphology needs and the environment in which they live. But I, I, to my knowledge specifically, I, there's not a massive difference in the in the skeletal system, but I stand to be corrected. Okay, thank you very much. Um, we have a question in the chat whilst we wait for the student to come up. Um, the question from the chat is, would the weight of the tusks affect the posture of the elephants? Um, okay, sorry, Papila, I'll just jump in here again as well. Um, in terms of affecting their posture, no, externally you wouldn't see a giant impact from the weight of the tusks. Um, they are able to carry them quite easily. Um, when you get into the big tusker frame, which is an elephant that's got um, tusks that extend more than sort of two meters from the lip line, then you can see a lowering of the of the skull. And what we are finding in the skeletons of the in particular of the large tuskers, we are finding evidence of arthritis as a result of the weight of those tusks. So while you don't see an external impact on the um, actual posture itself, there is definitely a skeletal impact of the, the tusks. But in, in, in a so-called normal tusk elephant, you, you really wouldn't see a massive difference. They are built and their skeletal structure is built to handle that weight. Okay, hope that answers the question. <laughs> yes, Roxanne says thank you. Thank you, Kirsty. We can take a question from the class. Good afternoon. Uh, my question is a personal question. It is, are elephants more important to an environment than the environment is to elephants? <laughs> um, that's a... Um... One of those questions that it could be, how long is a piece of string? Uh, elephants are agents of change. So in terms of their impact, so they're what's known as a keystone species. So they are integral in terms of environment and the survival of the environment. And elephants are a hot topic when it comes to numbers. So there is a lot of question marks on how many elephants is too many elephants? So in other words, when does that essential agent of change take it too far that it becomes a destructive situation? But in terms of environment, elephants and other keystone species are essential for the environment. So that's a very sort of broad overview of that question. As I say, we, I could probably keep you here for the next couple of hours discussing that one. Thank you. And la the last question is a follow-up to them being a keystone species did they uh, take a role of a keystone species or did they adapt to it because i know they like migrated around the world a lot well when you say take on the role yes it is it is a primary role so it's not something they've adapted to it's something they they have always done so migrating into areas has just, it, it benefits the area. So you wouldn't only have elephants as the keystone species. So a lot of browsers, so a kudu, for example, is also a keystone species. So it's not something they adapt to, it's something that they do. As I say, it's just the impact of what they do. The elephants have a greater propensity to be able to impact on a higher level than any of your other keystone species. Okay, thank you. Uh, I would just like to ask, this morning over the radio, I they were talking specifically about elephants, and they mentioned in the Nesna forest there's only one female adult left. Uh, is there any plans to reintroduce more elephants in that area, or how is the conservation of that uh, population going to be controlled? Okay, <clears throat> sorry, excuse me. In terms of the Nesna elephant, there has been moves 
to reintroduce them. However, what's subsequently come out as times moved on is that it, the forest elephant or the Nazi elephant is a different subspecies. So to actually be able to reintroduce that species as it should be is actually not really something that's going to be possible. You've also got to take into account um, the complications of the development around that area and introducing a high impact species like an elephant, what that will actually do, given you've got such a populated area these days. So at this stage, the last um, I know of it, there's no plans to continue to try and reintroduce. They're just conserving what's there. Thank you. And then um, what are the biggest misconceptions about elephant conservation these days? <laughs> Another loaded question. <laughs> um, I think the biggest misconception is in terms of the types of management. Um, you know, there's a lot of debate on the culling issues. So I think a lot of people see management as easy um, and that they don't really understand um, you know, the behavioral patterns of elephants, how these come into play when you manage. Like Papila mentioned, just alone with the migratory, you know, Kruger Park is a long, narrow park. So we've already changed their migratory routes. So that's something we had to adapt into our management. So there's a lot of people who seem to think it's it's quite an easy process. You either move them out or you just find a way to, to control the numbers without having to go down the culling route. But it's quite a complex um issue that you have to look at, especially in the savannah environment, because you're dealing with that keystone concept. So you're looking at how fire, how water, how migratory patterns all play a role. So it's not just as straightforward as a lot of people are thinking. So from my perspective, I think that's one of the biggest misconceptions about having elephants in a natural environment. Okay, thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, my question is based on uh, that part where you mentioned uh, about poaching. Uh, can the deliberate removal of the task uh, help limit the risk of elephants being poached? And if that is possible, and how, what impact can it have on these animals? Yeah, okay. So looking at the idea of actually taking elephant tasks like out of the picture, the same idea they have when it looks to rhinos. For me, that won't change anything because if we take the rhinos, for example, what's happening to them as well, even though they've been dehorned, they will still be targeted by poachers out there in the field. So another thing is when you're taking an elephant's tusk, you're kind of taking a very crucial part of its own, you know, characteristic. You, <laughs> we're making it change for in order to protect it surely, but then there's also a massive a massive chance that we may make making we may be making things even worse. But I'm not sure. Christy, you want to add? Um, yeah, just to add on to that. So you've got to keep in mind two different things here. So when you're talking rhino poaching, rhino horn is a renewable resource. So you might dehorn it, but the, the horn will continue to grow quite significantly and at a faster rate than you would with ivory. So removing of the ivory in, in theory could be a deterrent. Um, it depends on what the people are actually after, whether they want, because any you wouldn't be able to move, remove the ivory past um, the tooth pulp. So just like our teeth, Papila did show you in that tour, you saw how deep the root of the, the tusk actually is. So the furthest up you'd be able to remove is where that, that nerve ends. Otherwise, you would cause the elephant excruciating pain. Um, the cost implications of actually darting elephants to remove the tusk and the root would be astronomical. So feasibly, it's, it's well, yes, it would be a deterrent. It's not the most feasible option. And again, do you really want to see elephants without tusks? Impact-wise to the elephants, again, in theory, it, it wouldn't negatively impact them. They can cope without their tusks. However, in the savannah environment, tusks are tools to a large degree. They're using it for uprooting trees, pulling grass, all that sort of aspects. So you could hinder them in that respect by removing their tusks. It's not really a, a very feasible um, option in terms of preventing poaching. Fortunately, within Kruger, our elephant poaching is, is very negligible. We don't really have a massive issue at this stage. Um, not to say we're not keeping our eyes peeled, but it's not something we really need to consider at this stage. 
Okay, thank you. Uh, another question uh, is that uh, besides uh, poaching, are there other, uh, other challenges that uh, elephants face in their environments like diseases and et cetera? Um, look, elephants have very few natural predators besides um, essentially loss of food. So disease is one of the few that can impact them. There's a number of diseases that can impact. So foot and mouth is one of them. Um, you've got the EMC virus, which is another one, but it's it's not, it doesn't impact them in numbers high enough for it to be a concern. Um, you might get an EMC virus outbreak and that's carried by rodents. Um, and that's where the age old fable of elephants being scared of mice actually comes from. Um, so you might lose a couple of elephants if there is an outbreak, you might lose up to sort of 10 elephants within a small area, but it's not something that spreads and it's not something that's going to put the population at risk. And that is one of our biggest challenges when it comes to managing elephant populations is there is no real natural predators to, to the elephant population. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I have a few questions from the chat. I'll read two questions from the chat, then I'll come back to the class. The first question is from Lisole. They say, thank you for the informative presentation. If I may ask, what is the weaning age of the elephant? Secondly, what is the difference between a savanna and forest elephant? Lisole, are you typing it? Oh, sorry, I was still reading the question as she was talking. <laughs> Okay, if I'm asked what is the winning age of the elephant? Uh Christy, isn't that like roughly five years old? Usually around that. Okay, then secondly, the difference between a savanna and a forest elephant are different biomes and also their tusks are not quite the same. Our savanna elephants have much bigger, thicker curved tusks. When you look at the forest elephant's tusks, they kind of have a tingy brown to it, then they're kind of more narrow and straight, almost looking like a Asian elephant's tusk. Hopefully that helps. I don't know if you can see the back. I don't know if I've managed to share my screen. There yes. It is. I'll leave it up for a little bit while we ask the next question. Okay. Um, the next question is a little bit loaded. Sorry to keep you waiting in the class. Um, it's from Bronwyn, and they ask, from an exhibition point of view, which aspect of the hall is the most liked or used by visitors, particularly the children? And can you explain why? That's the first part of the question, so you can answer that. Huh. <laughs> uh... We get a variety of guests coming into the Elephant Museum. Um, some of them come mainly to see the tuskers that we have on display. So they'll spend much of their time on the side where you find the Magnificent Seven. Um, but when you look at the younger kids, they get fascinated by looking at how big the elephant skeleton is and how the height wall actually is relative to any human. So it's more interactive and more, uh, how can I put it, more engaging with the younger generation in my opinion. Christy? I think you put the nail on the head there. I think everybody comes to the Elephant Hall for a personal reason. We get a lot of repeat visitors, we get a lot of first time visitors and they all resonate with something um, special in that, that environment. But we have tried and, and as Babila has already alluded to that the height wall and a lot of the actual um, physical displays we try to incorporate for young kids. And the more interactive the, the display, the more the kids engage. And I think we've also got what we call a touch and feel room where we've got um, additional skins and skeletons and the kids seem to really resonate mostly with that. Okay. And the second part of the question is, any tips for developing an exhibition of this type? Um, they, they acknowledge that it's a loaded question, but if you could even answer it briefly. I'd say get your sanity checked first and see if you really want to go down that road. <laughs> Um, but yeah, look, essentially funding is going to be the first, first thing you need. Without funding, you're going nowhere. These are not um, inexpensive centers to set up. We were very lucky in that Goldfields um, at the time came forward and actually funded the, the structure and the building. 
So if you've already got that, and then you can look at um, bringing in groups to do your actual displays. But the, uh, if you're going to do it, look at where your interest lies. I think that's primarily one of the biggest things. Um, try and keep it interactive as possible. Um, that's very important. People need to want, be able to engage with something. So for us, by having the tusks here, yeah, having those interactive activities, it makes people want to keep coming back because you essentially need feet on the floor to justify um, what you're doing. Other sort of things that you can do, what we did in terms of um, upgrading our facility was approaching groups and we used a university that had design students. So we created opportunities for students um, to be able to develop and gain skills of working within this sort of environment. So there's a lot of ways you can go about it. Um, but it, the important thing is making sure that you, you know what your audiences are after before you even start. I don't know if that really answers the question. Yeah, I will see. Um, may we please take a question from the class? Sorry to keep you waiting. Okay, sorry. Uh, greetings, everyone. Uh, I once saw an elephant digging for water using a stick. So my question is, how and why did elephants gain such adaptation of using tool? And how do they navigate or detect for other groundwater in the most dry environment? Elephants are always learning. Um, they are uh, remembering the fact that they, uh, the matriarch learned all that she knows from the, the past mothers, the sisters that are in the group, and she knows where to find food as well. Another thing we have to be remember is that elephants can hear vibrations using their own feet. So they'll pretty much know where exactly to dig to find a specific uh, water point if it's in a drought season, so to speak. Um, Kirsty, would you like to add more? Um, yeah, it, it's not necessarily ad a adaption as opposed to a, a, a normal behavioral motion for elephants. And keep in mind what I said again about the keystone species. So one of the things elephants are known to do in drought times is through that digging, they actually create water environments for other species. And by digging in riverbeds in particular, it's also a filtering action. So you've got a guarantee of having cleaner water. So especially in drought times where your water is, is getting quite low, you get a lot of algal blooms coming up because the water and the heat are usually quite extreme. By digging in that riverbed and allowing the water to actually filter into those holes that they create, you are encouraging a clean water supply. Okay. Okay, another question. The trunk of elephant is the most uh, sensitive organ found in the mammals based on the research. So my question is that if is the most sensitive organs uh, in the elephants, how do they even use it to grab or to collect food using uh, their trunk if, if it is the most sensitive organs? Like how, how is that? Um, okay, when, when we talk about sensitivity, it doesn't necessarily mean um, sensitivity of feeling. It's, it's uh, the nerve um, and hair lines, all of those are vital in terms of smells and senses. So it's not as sensitive in that it's going to hurt if it, if it does something with the tusk. I don't know if I'm understanding your correct question correctly. Yeah. Is yeah. that what you were referring to? Yeah, I wasn't sure whether it's itself or if you, if, if you just think about your nose, for example, and the ability to sense smells and all of that components of your nostrils, that so it's, your nose doesn't hurt, but it is an, a sensitive organ. So it's very similar concept. It's just a heightened um, ability as opposed to us because of the sheer numbers of those membranes and the fibers and the hairs, their sensitivity, they can pick up smells greater distances than, than most species can. So that's more what we mean in terms of sensitivity than actual feeling, as it were. Oh, okay, thank you. I got it now. Um, we have a couple of questions from Andy D, and I don't know if you would like to unmute and ask your questions. Okay, I see he keeps unmuting and muting, so maybe we'll wait for a second. But I'll read another question from Lisule. They say any birth control methods available for countries with high populations of elephants like Botswana? Um, 
the birth control methods in, available in Botswana are also available in South Africa. So you've got an, a number of different options in terms of, of types of birth control. So you get an estradiol implant and you also get a type of um, injection, but you've got to keep in mind in terms of Kruger National Park's context that we are conserving biodiversity. So use of birth control is not really a, a viable option here because then we are basically we deciding who can breed and who can't breed. So we're interfering in natural processes. So it's not something we actually actively engage in. It was tested in the park and it was decided it wasn't feasible. Um, smaller reserves around Kruger and the greater Kruger, they use these to quite um, good effect because they are much smaller reserve sizes and they don't want breeding of any nature. Um, the most popular is actually the elephant vasectomy. And the primary reason for this is it's very effective. It's a once off application as opposed to the birth control for the, the females. And so you've got very little impact on your population. It's a short surgery. It's about two hours these days. And, it's, and once it's done, it's done. So what you also end up there and the benefit there is behaviorally. Um, because once an elephant vasectomy is done, your elephant bull behavior changes quite significantly. He no longer actively seeks out your females and he also has that desire to roam disappears. So where your, a lot of your smaller reserves were having massive problems with their bulls breaking through fences and moving, um, you no longer have that challenge in terms of, of their um, behavioral. The testosterone level basically decreases. So yes, all of those methods are available to us. But the challenge comes in in terms of mandate. So you've got to look at what the actual mandate of your area is and what you're trying to achieve before you actually use that. Thank you, Kirsty. We can take a question from the class. Uh, follows on the previous one. I wanted to ask if uh, overpopulation is a problem and uh, which other methods can be used to control it. Um, okay, overpopulation is, it's at the moment, it's what you would call a subjective question. Because Kruger Park, in terms of our management, has abolished a set number. We, we work on an adaptive the management approach. So that basically means we're learning by doing. And what we're doing um, in terms of our numbers, our management policy at the moment focuses very heavily on restoring the natural environment. So not looking at the causes or the effects, but the causes of, the, of where elephants are spending their time. What is the impact? What is actually happening? So elephants are an incredibly elephant and um, water dependent species. And one of the determinations was that water is obviously one of the biggest drivers. So we have embarked on quite an extensive program of removing um, artificial water to try and recreate a more natural um, approach and to get them back into that normal migratory patterns. So at this stage, there's no limit on the numbers. So to say whether we've got an overpopulation or not, um, yeah, it's, it's a question mark because there isn't actually a set number. So what's been happening at the moment is they're monitoring the impacts and looking through the census of where our elephants are congregating. So whether or not moving that artificial water has actually had success or not. So in terms of the different types of management when you're dealing with a fenced in area, obviously translocation is the easiest, but the, the challenges that come with that and moving elephants into other areas is within a very short space of time, especially if you're dealing with a small reserve, they're in the same situation we are in, especially if they allow breeding. Um, we've got culling is considered a, a viable option. It is an improved way of, of dealing with elephants, but obviously with the ethics side of it, it's, it's one of the big um, ones that's being avoided at this stage. And then the contraceptive um, approach is one of the other big ones. So those are the main sort of uses. And as I say, this adaptive management approach where we are looking at trying to use elephants behavior to manage themselves at the moment. So that's still a, a work in process and to see whether we'll be able to get that right. Uh, okay, thank you. Um, and I wanted to ask, uh, what can we do as the general public to raise awareness on elephant conservation? Oh. <laughs> education, education, education. I mean, the more people are aware of what's actually happening. And as I say, there's a lot of misconceptions about how straightforward it is. 
Um, when you deal with the general public, you get a lot of sort of oversimplification of the issue. You've got people who are passionate about animals and who tend to look at it as you've just got to keep everything alive, you, you know, and they don't really understand that there's got to be some form of active management. So I think, you know, the awareness is, is key with any species and any species conservation. Um, the ability to educate and use interpretation as a tool to get awareness out there cannot be overemphasized. Um, and I think that's one of the key things that, that can be done um, to try um, from your side is in terms of a perspective of what can be done. Okay, thank you. Um, I have, I'm have. i going to read the two questions from Andy, then I'll go to Faith and go back to the class. The first question from Andy is, does um, the absence of an elephant from an ecosystem lead to a decrease in biodiversity? Sorry, say again, sorry, I missed that. Um, does the absence of elephants from an ecosystem lead to a decrease in biodiversity? Um, <laughs> it's, it's a question that would have to be researched. Um, we have got exclusion plots um, where people are looking at, so specifically areas that have had absolutely no elephant impact over the last sort of 30, 40 years. Um, I don't know if it would um, result in a loss of biodiversity, because remember what I said about other species also being keystone. Yeah. Um, I'm not, it's, I don't think it's something we would have, we've had the chance to actually really go into. You know, the exclusion plots are there for researchers to look into those specific um, issues, but I can't foresee that we would lose a mass amount of biodiversity, specifically based on the fact that elephants are not our only keystone species. I think the bigger concern is that the high numbers of elephants will start causing a um, impact to biodiversity. Okay, um, Dan can ask, can an elephant produce twins, triplets or more? Um, they can. Um, we've got a few um, of our um, females here that have had twins. Triplets, I have not actually um, ever heard of or seen any recording of triplets. And twins, are, to be able to raise twins is also quite unusual. So you, it's not unusual to have them, it's for both of them to survive. Um, that is the sort of more unusual. Um, we have one matriarch who we keep tabs of because she is a big tusker, so we know her movements. And she's successfully raised, I think she's, had, she's on her third set of twins. So it's not impossible. Um, the big sort of catch would be having enough resources to be able to keep them alive. So in times of plenty, good rains, good food supply, yes, they they can get it. Um, they can get it right. Um, in harsh environments, you might find that the the weaker of the two would be left behind. Um, the last question from Andy reads: Should we consider the views or feelings of elephants in making decisions about them? Would awarding elephant legal rights, say like human rights, lead to a change in the management strategy? Yo, I've got a future EFA employee here. Um, he apologizes for asking such a tricky question. <laughs> it, it's not so much that it's a tricky question. It, 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 there is a reality to dealing with elephants and that their mental capacity is much higher than when if you're dealing with something like an impala, for example. There is a huge um, emotional component, and it is one of the challenges that people face. Um, ask anybody who works in elephant management. Um, culling, for example, is, is one of the worst things you'll ever have to do in your life. Um, it's what a lot of people refer to as a necessary evil in terms of elephant management. Um, affording them legal rights, I mean, that would, yes, it would protect them, absolutely, but we've got to face some reality. That's why I say the simplicity of elephant management is just not there. Uh, at the end of the day, we have fences. We have communities around our, our game reserves. We've got a responsibility. The moment we put that fence up, we, we accepted the responsibility of having to manage and manage in accordance with what's best for the animals as well as what's going to ensure the long-term survival. Um, you know, one of, there's a lot of, efforts within management, especially of, of elephants, to look at alternatives. Nobody wants to go back to a culling situation. So mega conservation parks are one of the, the solutions. Um, joining a lot of your conservation areas with 
um, corridors where elephants have freedom of movement. So, but we've always got to keep in mind that you're going to have the, the human wildlife conflict that's always going to exist. And as long as we've got people living around our, our natural areas, that's something that we have to keep in focus. So, yeah, it, it's the emotional component is, is difficult, but you, you've got to take, sometimes you've got to step back from that emotion and, and look at what's going to be the, the bigger picture. And it's, it's not very hard. I mean, not very hard. It's very hard to actually do sometimes because of just the, what is known about elephants and known about their propensity for be able to show emotion. Um, I'm not sure if I answered the question um, to satisfaction, but um, yeah, it's, it's a difficult one. You've got, you've got people fighting from every different side. So you've got your animal rights, you've got your conservationists, you've got people who call preservationists, you, you've got so many different opinions. And fortunately, the people who have to make those decisions on a much higher pay grade than, than we are, because um, it's not an easy thing to do. Cool. Thank you, Kirsty. Uh, we can take a question from the class. Good day. Uh, a while ago, I read an article stating that elephants easily suffers from post-traumatic stress disorder after experiencing traumatic events um, like poaching, for example. How do you treat this condition within the elephants? Um, well, in a natural environment, you don't. Um, you don't treat them. But it, it is a huge um, reality. Uh, we talk about the 80s, especially in the Kruger Park context of what they talked about, so total onslaught when the elephant poaching was extreme. And if you look at places like Mozambique, where um, landmines were common, you often had elephants with horrific injuries from that. Um, you had elephants being shot. So a lot of those elephants, and you can generally see in their behavior patterns, the difference in those elephants. They'll be a lot more skittish. They'll be um, very anti-people. Um, but what in terms of treating them, we, we've got a natural environment here. So they've got enough space to get away from us. There's, there's really not much you can actually do to physically treat um, the stress um, symptoms. You've just got to remove the stresses at the end of the day. So within our natural environment, those stresses don't exist. But obviously, we've got elephants that cross boundaries. Um, Elephants don't forget they, their ability to remember their brain capacity is huge. Um, the brain is the same size as a human brain. Um, mm -hmm. They're capable of cognitive thought like we are. And they will often remove themselves from that situation. So it's just something you've got to be aware of. Thank but you very much. Ask, and then, yeah, not much you can do. <laughs> Thank you very much. And just a last question. Um, based on the population size, so except from removing all the artificial water sources within the Kruger National Park, I've also read an article, um, I don't know if it's true, I was just want to clarify, that the fence between the Kruger National Park and the south um, parts of Mozambique was taken down for a while um, to let the elephants move freely between South Africa and Mozambique. Was this, firstly, is it a true statement? And was it successful? Um, besides that, Mozambique was... Um, in war previously with all the landmines there. And the article also stated that they um, quickly returned to South Africa again, making it not successful. Um, if you can just please elaborate on that and um, saying if it's true and if it was successful. All right, um, so it is true, but not in the area you read. I'm not sure what, which article you read. It's not the south of the park, it's the north of the park. So what, what, what's happened in the north is the creation of the Limpopo Transfrontier National Park. So an area of, which is virtually a, a mirror image, if you look at a map of the Kruger Park north of the Olifants River, virtually a mirror image of Kruger has moved into Mozambique. So that has been declared a Transfrontier National Park. So we have access with a border post from Kruger into Mozambique, into the National Park. And part of, this was part of, Sort of the hopes of trying to get elephants to move across. Uh, success is relative, and if to try and put it into um, simple terms, so some of the fence has been dropped, not all of the fence has been dropped. So we do obviously have poaching issues, so um, a lot of the fences are not being taken down, um, but there are areas where the fence was removed. We translocated a number of elephants in the beginning um, to try and establish this transfrontier park. And yes, they, they did come home. Um, 
one of the challenges you're going to face, I mean, if you think about yourself, if somebody picks you up wherever you live and dumps you three hours away, you're going to try and go home. That's where you're from. It's, it's what you know. Elephants being um, hugely water dependent, one of the challenges within the Trans Frontier Park is water. So in the south of the park, we, you've got the Olifants River. So that's one of the main sources, but that's also unfortunately where a lot of the human population is as well. Um, further north into the park is very seasonal water. So in terms of one of the drivers for elephant movement being water, that's one of the challenges. So elephants are not naturally moving into the area in massive numbers because there's no water. So the, in terms of landmines and that sort of thing, it has been cleared. The area is safe and obviously there's tourism in the area but it hasn't had as great an impact as we had hoped on, on elephant numbers. And that's primarily, um, as I say, a water supply situation. Uh, breeding herds that got moved across have tended to stay in the area. And this is because they aren't able to cover the, the massive areas that the bulls are. So the bulls have the luxury of being able to move in and out depending on resource availability. So that's generally the situation we're sitting in right now. Thank you very much. Um, we had a question from Eric in the chat about elephant stress and the brain capacity, but I think Kirsty, you covered that in the questions that I just asked in the class. Eric, if you would still like to ask a question, please write it in the chat. Um, there's one more question from Roxanne. She says, I'm studying to be a field guide and they tell you you need to separate your emotion from what nature is there to do. How can one do that? with immense difficulty. Um, a lot of people go into conservation with two different mindsets. You, you've got what we call the bunny huggers who tend to be the, the animal lovers and, and they want to save everything. And then you get the, the very practical side of people who are quite able to remove emotion quite easily. Uh, you, you've got to just keep in mind that there's a, as I keep saying, there's a bigger picture to conservation. Nothing is as easy as, as you think. And um, to, yeah, I find it difficult. I think I tend towards the bunny hugger side. I, I do love my animals, but you've got to be realistic when you're managing for benefits of biodiversity, when you're managing for the survival of conservation as an as industry, you've got to start looking practically at what needs to be done. So the loss of one animal for the saving of 100, for example, is sometimes the way to go. Um, so you, it's it's not easy. You've just got to look at the bigger picture the whole time. Ask yourself why we're we doing what we're doing. So as long as you can put that into context, then you can start learning how to do that. It's not always easy, and it can be very difficult sometimes to make the hard decisions. But ultimately, you've got to keep asking yourself what is best for conservation and what is going to be best for the future of conservation. Thank you, Kirsty. Um, sorry, before we just take the question in in the class, I think everybody saw it pop up on their screen. We have a poll. So if you could spare a few seconds to answer the questions of the poll, we'd appreciate that. Thank you. We can take a question from the class. Uh, good, good day. So my, my question is, uh, how do the male species uh, identify their potential or their mate partner? And also my second question is, are the male species considered as a territorial a species? Um, okay, so sorry, I just want to clarify, you're asking how do they identify their mates and are males territorial? Yes, that's uh, my two okay. questions. All right, so much like human beings, um, they put on a show. Um, so if you think about how a you know, woman will get dressed up, put makeup on, put perfume on, it, it's a very similar concept. So the females emit a hormone that indicates when she is receptive, so when she's gone into estrus. And the male, that will usually trigger in the males what we know as must. And when you see a male elephant with the temporal lobes, they've got that sort of um, secretion. Usually between the legs, there's a large amount of urine and it's quite a pungent smell. So that response will then attract the, the, the male to the female that is, is um, essentially an estrus. And that's where nature kicks in. We don't always know why she chooses the male she chooses, but there's obviously something in that scent 
that makes her decide that this is the male um, I've decided to, to choose. But as I said, it's a combination. So her going into estrus, releasing that hormone will attract the male who then goes into must. Um, in terms of the territorial, it, it's not so much a territorial issue as opposed to a home range. So your bull elephants tend to be loners. They will have a large home range and those ranges will often overlap. Um, where uh, a fight might occur is when you're dealing with a must bull who is looking for a suitable mate. So that's where you might get some aggression and you might get fighting. So it wouldn't necessarily be over the territory or the home range, as it were, but it would be over the, um, the breeding rights. So a territorial wouldn't be what I wouldn't call them territorial. I would call them um, reliant on home range. No, what I think Amanda, Amanda, my last question is, as a zoology student, if I were to venture into the into studying elephants, what are the like interesting things I can uh, expect along the way in my studying of elephants? And also, uh, if I were to study elephants, where would I like work? Um, okay, well, to answer the first part, expect the unexpected. <laughs> Um, working with species like elephants, um, you will constantly learn. Um, and I think if you've got to, you've got to go into it knowing that you're going to learn. Where you where you would work, I mean, well, obviously with the elephants. So it just depends on what aspect of research you're going in there. I see Andy's put in a research suggestion about um, keystone species and biodiversity. There's a lot of scope for researchers. Um, there's a lot that's still unknown. There's a lot that's still being looked at in terms of elephant impacts. Um, one of the, as a, so the key species, when we talk about the, the keystone impact and our numbers, where we said we don't have a cap on numbers. So one of the great research opportunities at the moment is um, loss of biodiversity on a, a macro and micro level. Um, so there's a lot of different opportunities to go into it. So follow your instincts of what interests you, because obviously when doing research, don't just do it for the sake of being able to do research, but and look at what's going to really fascinate you and be able to make a difference. And um, the tendency is to look at the same issues over and over again, and there's a lot of new um, opportunities out there. Um, if you want to engage more, I'm sure we can, um, Johan can give out our email address. Yeah. And we can always try and help you a bit further in that regard. Um, but yeah, and to, as a job opportunities where they are. Um, unfortunately, those are quite scarce. But there are a lot of organizations like Elephants Alive, for example, that do permanent research on, on species like elephants. So you've just got to get out there and have a look at what's available. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I have another question from Eric. I think you've touched up on it a little bit, but he asks, do elephants cope with emotions? And are they able to know that um, one of them is missing or dead? And do they moan? Um, there's a lot of um, speculation on the elephant mourning process. People have talked in the past about elephant graveyards and elephants going to specific places to die. Um, that is a larger myth. However, elephants do have an incredible capacity for mourning and it is quite an emotional um, thing to experience. So whenever elephants come across a carcass of another elephant, you will see quite a distressing type of behavior they do actively mourn. They'll often kick the, the, the different bones around. Sometimes they'll attempt to cover some of the bones. And for many years to come, when they come across these bones on their migratory patterns, you will see some form of engagement. So yes, they do definitely have a mourning um, process and a high sort of level of emotion attached to the loss of a, another um, elephant. And it's quite well documented in that respect. You can read up quite a bit about that. Oh, thank you, Kirsty. Do we have another question from the class? Yes, we do. Go ahead. Um, hello. Are there any ongoing research projects or discoveries in the field of elephant conservation that you find particularly exciting? Sure. <laughs> There's lots. Um, one of the things I am fascinated with at the moment is specifically biodiversity loss. Um, we spend a lot of time saying that if elephant numbers um, get out of hand, we're gonna lose species. And we tend to focus on the big species. We tend to look at the, the large scale browsers. We tend to look at things like Marshall eagles. 
but the more research going into the smaller um, levels about potential already um, extinctions is quite fascinating. Um, obviously, elephant migration is quite a, a fascinating topic. Um, I also manage a project known as the Tuskers Project, the large Tuskers. So I spend a lot of time monitoring our large tusk bulls within the Kruger National Park, um, looking at their movements, what the drivers are, um, what criteria often come up in terms of becoming a big tusker. So there's a genetic component to that, which I find quite fascinating. So the, the options are, are endless. There's a lot of very interesting research going on. Okay, thank you. The second question is, what's the most fascinating or surprising behavior you've seen between elephants? Uh, okay. Um, you know, the, I suppose surprising one was um, watching two males engaging in a, a mating courtship, which I didn't realize was something that actually happened within the elephant species. Um, it was quite an interesting um um, process to actually see because um, it followed all the same um, sort of lines as the female but eventually sort of culminated into a bit of a, a teenage fight as it were but it was just interesting to see that experimentation and play aspect coming out on the behavior okay thank you do we still have any more questions from the class have another question. All right. Okay, we've got one more. I think this is the final student. Um, yeah. one more question from the class. Cool, thank you. Uh, I think it was shared on the screen. Uh, there was a red list uh, showing that the uh, elephants, there are elephants that are endangered, and then some are endangered. And yeah, so. My question was that, uh, where do you see the future of the elephants in the next 10 or 20 years to come? Yeah. Okay, you guys like answering, asking some loaded questions. <laughs> um, look, conservation efforts worldwide are, are gaining. I would like to say that we will start seeing an improvement in, in some of your rarer species. Um, there are a lot of good people on the ground fighting very hard to ensure survival of those species. Um, you know, elephants are a difficult one because if you look at Kruger Park, most people will tell you we've got too many elephants. Um, whereas if you go into areas like Mozambique and Botswana, they are being poached into extinction. So I think in a dream world, I'd like to say that conservation efforts and human greed will start balancing out, um, it's it's difficult to say which way we're gonna go. We are fighting, we're educating as much as we can. Um, Papila and I, our main role is educating and getting people to think ab about conservation and to, to look at that bigger um, reality of what impacts, you know, right down to what it will do to your economy if you don't have, you know, wildlife. So trying to get people to realize that it's not just an animal, that there is a massive, um, network that, that relies on that animal being there. So in my dreams, I'd like to say that in 10 years time, we'll see things being improved. Um, but I think it's going to be a case of watch the space. Um, but as long as we've got people studying and we've got people who prepared to get out there and do the, the hard jobs, I think we've got a hope. Okay, thank you. Um, we have a question from um, Aziza. You say you have a question. Would you like to unmute and ask your question? Hello. Hi, we Hello, can hear you. Uh, my name is Aziza Zohora from uh, National Museums of Kenya. Uh, first of all, I'm sorry that I came late uh, in the meeting. Uh, I just wanted to ask a question. I'm from National Museums of Kenya. I work at Zoology Department, Mammalogy Department. Uh, here at the museum, uh, we specialize with small mammals, but uh, I also have ideas about the large mammals. So I just wanted to request if there is something you can do about uh, uh, the elephants, uh, because here in our collection, we have uh, we have a skin of, uh, of the elephant that uh, it has overstayed the uh, elephant, the, the elephant that uh, which was uh, 
endangered species, which was, uh, it was called Ahmed, which it had uh, the one of the longest task. So this uh, skin it has overstayed in the collection. So I uh, just wanted to ask uh, for us to do this conservation and save about this elephant, can you do something about uh, coming up with a trophy or we do a campaign on how we can uh, bring up uh, this skin because it has overstayed in the collection. Yeah, do a campaign about uh, reviving uh, this uh, Ahmed of Marsabit. Yeah, because it's one of the species that uh, has the longest task in Kenya. Thank you. Um, so I'm not sure exactly what your question is. So you're asking what can you do to promote the story? Am I understanding you correctly? Aziza? Yes, exactly. What can you do about, because uh, this uh, this topic, I've attended later mm. uh, 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 this meeting uh, about this topic. I just wanted to do, you you people, if, if something can be done about uh, this skin because it has overstayed in the collection, uh, it's about uh, the the elephant Ahmed, the elephant uh, Ahmed of yeah. Marsabit of Kenya. Yes. Yeah. So yeah, no, and uh, yeah, yeah, and come up with like a trophy. Um, well, look, that that depends entirely on you. I have heard of Ahmed's story, and I do know his tusks. I think they're probably the largest, one of the largest in the world, if I remember correctly. Yeah. Something can be done. Can, can any campaign been done to to upbring um, this species up to, about the elephant? Yeah, that's um, look. Uh, maybe if you get my contact details, we can engage um, on a on a different platform. It's because it's a bit difficult to sort of answer off at the top of my head of of different types of things you could do. But I mean, there certainly are options where you could utilize. Um, as you as you say, you've got the skin. Hello? Yes, it is only one skin which is in the collection yeah. that remained the whole world, you see? And this skin, okay. we have to save it, you see? We have yeah. to save this. So how can we revive it to come up with uh, another elephant to, to do... To oh, save how do you revive the yeah. species? Yeah, to do like something oh, like okay. a Okay, sorry, I'm with you now. Can com any campaign be done if, it's, Look, if it is possible? You know, I, I work with the large tuskers in, in Kruger, and there's a lot of um, evidence that it's a genetic strain. So, I mean, Kenya, Ambasili, Tanzania area, they're one of the few places that have still got the mega tuskers as well. Um, I know there's a huge drive within your areas where people, they've actually got people following these tuskers to protect them because they are being hunted. Um, yeah, it, it's education I think is yeah I keep going back to it it's ultimately the key but you've got quite a lot of challenges there in terms of human wildlife conflict so I think that's always going to be one of the big challenges but the genetics are there I mean as long as elephants can be conserved your your genetic strain is is very strong in Kenya I'm not sure if I've really answered your question Yeah, yes, you have. Um, but yeah, as I said, you're welcome to get my email address and we can certainly engage a bit further if we'd, you'd like some more inputs on, on that. Um, I don't see any questions in the chat and I don't think the students have any more questions. And so that leads me to thank you, Kirsty and Papile, for taking your time to answer our questions. You were so comprehensive. You explained in great detail, and I think we all leave this talk having learned a great deal about, about elephants and the Litaba Elephant Hall. Um, and it's half past three, so I think we've come to the end of the talk. Thank you to everyone that came today. Huge thank you to the students at UFS for, for coming and engaging with you and engaging with the content you had. I'd like to wish everybody a good day further, and yeah, we've come to the end of the talk. Thank you. Thanks so much. Have a great day, everyone.